I think as weapons get longer ranges, as aircraft have gotten more expensive and the willingness to lose one has decreased, I think the physical training will start taking a backseat to cognitive training because I don't think you'll see as many of those old school engagements where two aircraft are tying up and you're pulling a lot of G's to try and get to the other person's six o'clock. I think you're going to see a lot more processing information off of what you've observed and how you've oriented to that information, making the right decision and taking the right action, right? The John Boyd OODA loop, but instead of applying it to basic fighter maneuvers, applying it to beyond visual range weapons employment. Welcome back, everybody. Another week here on Mops and Mo's with Drew and Alex. And before we kick things off this week, I have another public service announcement. And it's more of a call out than anything. I want to call out people that back into parking spots. Um, I hate all of you. I think that it's, we're about to lose our whole army audience over this. And I, and I was going to comment on that because working on a military installation, uh, you run into two problems. Number one, pretty much everybody on the installation shows up at the same time. So getting into a parking lot can become a little bit chaotic, but what makes it even more chaotic is idiots that drive past the spot only to then hit it into reverse when you think that you're just going to follow them and then proceed to back into the spot. It has it's happened combat to me. parking, baby. They get trained in it. They got to do it. Listen, no one is invading your installation. You don't need to bug out that quickly. You can go <laughs> forward into the parking spot and make it so much easier for the rest of us to get to where we're going. If I, almost rear end another person on a military parking lot because you're backing in. That'll be the end of this podcast. So again, just a little public, sir. I don't know. I don't know if that's on brand for mobs and Mo's, but uh, no, this is, this is classic drew privilege where he gets to complain about things on the podcast, <laughs> but then he doesn't have to deal with the DMS from people who have. Yeah. So if you guys, about it. if you guys, so I want to say it's important. If you want to yell at Drew, the DMs are not the place. There is a contact form. And I think we publicly <laughs> say the email is plenty. So it's Drew at mopsandmoes.com. M-O-P-S-N-M-O-E-S.com. You can hit him up directly <laughs> if you have feelings about backing into parking spots based on your military background. And as the person who designs all the website, I'm now going to reroute that email to uh, your Instagram. So you, you already route the contact <laughs> form to my email. How much stuff has to go to me? You know, are you, do you back, fire Drew. Do you Drew's back not a very good your, webmaster. Do you back into your parking spots? No, I very, very rarely back into parking spots. I'm not a big backer in her. It's infuriating. Uh, speaking though of, of driving uh, vehicles, who are we talking to this week? Driving vehicles, yes. Cars, not so much. So we are talking to Major Ridge, call sign Kelso Flick. He is a military pilot with over 2,000 cumulative flight hours in the T-6, the T-38, and most notably the A-10C. He flew A-10 combat missions in support of Operation Inherent Resolve and Operation Freedom Sentinel in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. He is currently the A-10C Program Element Monitor at Air Combat Command. In that role, Major Flick monitors all A-10C modernization and sustainment programs by working with the A-10 squadrons, the System Program Office, the A-10 Test Team, Headquarters Air Force, and other major command staffs to ensure the A-10 remains the greatest close air support aircraft in the world. The A-10, of course, being a favorite of ground forces. You know the sound to make. Uh, there it is. He received a Bachelor's of Science in Aeronautical Engineering from the United States Air Force Academy, a uh, Go Army Beat Air Force, where he was near the top of his class academically and captain of the lacrosse team. Which, by the way, if you haven't seen an A-10, that's definitely worth a YouTube. We've had an A-10 pilot on before. That was General Drowley. Um, and one of the things going into 2024 we've talked about doing more of is including or maybe spreading the conversation out to different branches, different folks who serve different kind of maybe discussions around human performance. And that's certainly the direction that we're heading in with this conversation. You will get, I think, a fair, your your fair share of, of war stories from the A-10 and just the ways in which the human body is required to perform when you're actually sitting in that aircraft. Um, interestingly, uh, you guys are also in for a treat. You'll be learning how to use the restroom uh, while you're in this single seat aircraft. Uh, Kelso gives us a a beautiful breakdown of sort of the um, 
what should we call it? The mechanics of relieving yourself while flying over the ocean in a single seat aircraft. So fantastic conversation. Always interesting. Um, one of the things we like to do with our pilots is ask them their favorite airframes. And that's, you know, I think one day it might lead to some healthy debate, but this was a fun one. Cool discussion of neck training in here too. That's something a lot of people have brought up. It applies a little bit differently in different situations. For fighter aircraft, you're talking about resisting G-forces and being able to maneuver when your head feels a lot heavier than it normally is, uh, but certainly applications to all sorts of different tactical professions, wearing helmets. Sometimes those helmets have all sorts of gear attached to them that you're dealing with, um, concussion issues, all that stuff. So definitely a solid discussion of neck training protocols. And you might be surprised at how low-tech the approach to neck training is, even in the fighter aircraft community. Boom. Enjoy. We ask this question to all the pilots we have on. And I, yeah, you were nodding when I brought it up. You have three call signs. He doesn't have three call signs. He has three first names. I, I know. He has three names. But it's, I mean, e any of those names could be call signs. <laughs> yeah. So let's start with the easy one. Uh, <laughs> Flick. It's from German descent. So it used to be the Von Flick family. The Flick stuck when we got to America. The Von got dropped for obvious reasons. Uh, if you're like a German American through World War One and World War Two, pretty heavily uh, <laughs> persecuted for just who you are. So the family got rid of the Von piece. Flick stuck. So that one was going to happen regardless of uh, my parents being hippies or not. Um, and then Ridge was a character on The Bold and the Beautiful. So there was a character named Ridge Forrester. My mom thought that's a cool name. If we have another boy, we should name him Ridge. Uh, <laughs> and then, bang, I was the last child. I was a boy. So Ridge ended up being my name. Um, ironically, the only normal name I have is my middle name, which is Robert. And that's uh, <laughs> owed to my Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob, God bless. Rest in peace, buddy. Uh, I got Robert as middle name. And then uh, Kelso is an acronym. Oh, okay. So, Kelso stands for kills and evades like Scott O'Grady. So I don't know if you guys have seen Behind Enemy Lines with Owen Wilson. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's supposed to be trying to tell the story of Scott O'Grady. Um, they significantly glorify how well he did as a survivor. So in the real story, like didn't know how to use a survival radio. When the PJs got to hit the ground to go get him, he like comes running out of a bush with his pistol drawn. Oh. Uh, and the PJs almost dropped him right there on the spot. Um, instead, they like had to like knock the gun out of his hand and restrain him and then like toss him on the helicopter and grab his weapon and get out of there. Um, he's just not a good survivor. So and that's you. And I was a lieutenant in Korea. Uh, I was sent out like three weeks into my tour in Korea to be a survivor for a combat search and rescue exercise. And I made just about every mistake you could possibly make. Uh I learned a ton, but I heard about it at the next roll call. So uh, it was like two or three roll calls after that uh, horrific incident that me and my buddy were getting our call signs and somebody came up with the acronym kills and evades like Scott O'Grady. Yeah. So, excellent. I love the depth on that one. <laughs> is, so is that the real yeah. story? Is that the PC story you have to tell people? That's the real story. No, that's the real story. I like that. That's the real story. And you're lucky that we're not meeting in person or else it would have cost you three beers. Oh, okay. There's a new rule. I didn't know that rule, but I like that. Yeah. Uh, so we're not supposed to just go mouthing off about how we got our call signs, but I figure <laughs> this question was going to come up. Yeah. I was prepared to waive the three beer requirement for you guys. Yeah. It's just standard pilot protocol, I think. <laughs> yeah. Now I want to trigger you because um, humor performance. So, my background with the Air Force, there was a lot of conversation around, depending on where you were at and depending on kind of what echelon you were working with. But, you know, the tactical athlete conversation with pararescue, it made sense because this is sort of a ground force and what we would, you know, think of as like a Green Beret type environment made sense when we're training pararescue men because they're on their feet engaging with the enemy. But the, the pilot piece, I, I'm going to misquote whoever said this, but it was something about like effectively they have a desk job that just kind of moves fast, which I know is not necessarily true. You know, is not necessarily true, but I wanted to toss that out to you to see what your thoughts would be on that and and hopefully start to drive the conversation around human performance for pilots. Yeah. So human performance for pilots is unique 
because for a lot of the time, you're exactly right. It's a fast moving desk job. And then there are these moments of just pure pressure and strain on the body. Um, so as an example, if we go out and do basic fighter maneuvers in the A-10, we're probably going to be able to execute about an hour and a half of fighting each other in air to air combat. And for us, it's all within visual range. So I'm going to spend like 45 minutes of that hour and a half hanging out somewhere between like three and six G's. Uh, and it's an extremely long amount of time to be trying to look over your shoulder at where the other aircraft is. You're maneuvering the airplane. So you've got some left, right forces, and then a lot of downward pressure on the neck and spine. Uh, cause it's six G's I weigh like 1200 pounds. <laughs> so that 1200 pounds of weight is sitting on my butt and my hamstrings, but it's also instead of my noggin being an eight pound noggin, now it's a 48 pound noggin. You know, every piece of my body now weighs six times more when I'm under six G's of pressure. Um, so what we were seeing for the longest time, and we still see in the fighter pilot community is a lot of issues on the neck and a lot of issues on the back, depending on the airframe. So if you talk to the F-16 guys, they have the 30 degree reclined seat. Um, and one of their big issues tends to be with the neck because they spend a lot of time with their neck craned forward and back uh, and they're pulling even more G's, right? 9G airframe. So if I were in an F-16 doing the same thing, I'd be 1800 pounds with a freaking 72 pound noggin. And I'm trying to turn that noggin and look around with it, even though it weighs 70 pounds. Um, so that is where the, the human performance aspect comes in, at least from a fighter pilot perspective. Um, tack onto that a little bit less commonly talked about is there's those long periods of time where we're taking off, we're heading to the airspace, things are normal. And then we may be doing uh, beyond visual range employment, doing air to air stuff where like, for the most part, it's lower G, but it's high processing. So you're taking in all the different sensor inputs. You're trying to make sure that your formation's in the right position to employ. And you're doing a ton of just processing, processing. At any point in time, you might end up in a scenario where now you have to get to one of these within visual range fights. You're turning at six to nine Gs for a minute and a half, two minutes to get to a kill. And then you come out of the backside of that and you go, I have to gain like situational awareness of what's going on in this big fight around me and start get back to all the processing. So you've got to be able to recover quickly from those engagements and get your head back in the game and start to understand the bigger picture as soon as you come out of it. Um, in the A-10, it's more common that that kind of fixation happens as we go into weapons employment against a ground target. So if I'm going to employ against a ground target, I'm rolling in, I'm completely fixated on the target. After I shoot or drop a bomb, I do a climbing safe escape maneuver. So that's four to five G's for about 20 seconds. Uh, and then as soon as I come out of that climbing safe escape maneuver, I'm checking my six o'clock to make sure nobody's shooting at me, checking the other six o'clock. And then I'm trying to pick up situational awareness on, you know, is my wingman doing all right? Is their weapons deployment look good? Are the friendly forces still okay? You know, if we're, have any kind of contested airspace? Do we have any red aircraft that are starting to encroach on where we're trying to do close air support or combat search and rescue or whatever? So it's the same idea, um, just from a little bit different lens of like, I'm not tying up with another fighter very often in an A-10, but I am tying up with some ground targets and then coming off and I've got to quickly recover and get my mental capacity back. So I think that's probably why there, it's easy to misinterpret the fast moving flying desk <laughs> <laughs> because like, yeah, I'm not, I don't have like an 80 pound ruck and I'm not going up a hill to get to a observation point. You know, I'm not dragging my 200 pound buddy out of the building after he's been wounded. Um, the things that we're doing are very much like sprint and recover type of, uh, performance. And then a lot of neck training, a lot of back training, mm -hmm. just trying to build up all of those muscle groupings along the spine so that, Ideally, instead of my spine taking the brunt of what the airplane's doing to me, my muscles are able to absorb that and handle those stresses. Um, and then the sprint and recover piece being for that mental capacity, because mm -hmm. 
if you're out of shape and you pull six G's for 30 seconds, you are panting and huffing and sweating in that airplane for like five minutes before your mind is really back to right. Well, and I, I hadn't ever even really thought of like, and I'm not going to use the exact phrasing that you just used, but like within visual range and then kind of out of visual range. And I, you know, I'm thinking of, cause having been out in Arizona and being around a tens, I mean, that's such a cool airframe, but it's a, I, like you said, I mean, it's kind of predominantly a within visual range airframe versus, I mean, here's me having never flown any of these, but like, I would imagine an F-22 or an F-35 in some sense, like you're engaging with something that you might not even be able to see. So does that play into the conversation at all in terms of like the physical requirements of the pilot, or is it just kind of all within the same ecosystem, if that makes any sense? I think it's, it's in the same ecosystem, but, um, as an example, so, and this is probably just because I am very in tune with the stressors and in tune with like the different types of training, but where the F-22 guys that I've seen working out here at Langley, they do a lot of like do a set and then they do a, a mental training exercise and then they do a set and then they do a mental training exercise. Um, and I think that is kind of the focus I was describing earlier of like, let's say you have to tie up within visual range, kill a bandit, and then you've got to come back out and get situational awareness on where are the rest of the aircraft? Where's mm -hmm. the next package of red aircraft that I need to engage? I focus a lot of my training on neck exercises uh, to go along with my normal strength and cardio regime because we in the A-10 spend a lot of time flying at night with NVGs mm -hmm. on the front of our faces. Uh, so you can imagine like, daytime when I'm doing that 5G safe escape maneuver uh, and I'm looking back over my shoulder, it's not as big of a deal. But when I take another pound and put it out in front of my face and attach it to my noggin, now I've got five pounds hanging off the front of my face that as I'm doing that same safe escape maneuver and trying to look over my shoulder. Uh, and I mean, during Inherent Resolve, I was flying eight and a half, nine hour missions with night vision goggles on for seven of those hours. So like the neck was really a, a focus point for me as to where some of the other guys, they don't even wear night vision goggles when they're flying at night, because like you said, everything they're going to do is beyond visual range or they're going to use sensors in the aircraft mm -hmm. to handle most of the tasks. So just a little bit different focus, but largely sprint and recover is pretty common throughout the fighter and attack communities. So you brought up neck training and I think there's a, a really interesting conversation there that applies to a few different sub audiences that we talk about or talk to, um, like ground forces are very interested in it from the standpoint of reducing neck and back injuries. They have to wear helmets with night vision all the time. There's some somewhat overrated evidence of neck training, mitigating concussion risk. That's a whole separate conversation about whether that's legitimate or not. And just having a, a big neck looks true. true. I but, mean, you know, if you're like, if you throw on the Thanksgiving sweater and you roll it up and you've got forearms and a neck, I think that, you know, that's always a win. Sorry. Anyway, back to your question. No, I was going to ask. We've we've seen a little bit of, of space where it's really popular is F1. We see a lot of neck training with the, the drivers for that. Would love to hear for you what neck training looks like. If somebody's listening to this podcast and wants to do some neck training, what is it? How do you train that kind of thing? Yeah. So here at Langley, we're lucky in that we actually have one of the machines for doing neck training. So it's one of the ones where you, you sit on it, it's got handles out in front of you, face cradle, and you can do resistance into it this way to work the front muscles of the neck. You can sit sideways, face cradle here and work side neck training. Um, and what I've been doing is trying to build up uh, strength to where I could get to using about 95 pounds consistently for sets of 10 in all four directions. Um, and now that I've got the strength built up, I'm working on the muscular endurance. So, okay, I could do 95 pounds for 10 reps. I don't think I need to get any thicker in the neck. What I would like to be able to do is hit 15 or 20 reps at those weights. Uh, because that's showing me that like, if I'm doing one of these basic fighter maneuver missions where I spend all this time looking backwards over my shoulder, trying to tell the student how they're screwing up and they need to attack <laughs> me better. Right. Like I can hit those reps 
And I know that my neck will stay strong. I'm not going to be taking the brunt of that along the spinal column. So that's where my training has been focused, right? When I didn't have the neck machine, I used a lot of towel resisted neck training, uh, which you could like, you could do it to yourself. You can just wrap the towel around the back of your noggin, apply pressure with the triceps and then resist against it and just use manual resistance for going forward side to side, a little harder to use on your own. But if you have a buddy to train with, you can have your buddy push the towel against your forehead and then push against it and just do manually resisted neck for the front or the sides. I've also seen that they do have like the noggin cradles, right? That you can attach like a 25 pounder on the noggin cradle, hang your head off the edge of a bench and then go the opposite direction. So there's plenty of ways to do it. I think all of those are pretty good. And then the other one that um, the OHWS team here, so uh, human weapon system team here has implemented, there's a lot of exercises that we do on initial warm up where we're laying prone and then doing just like, bring the noggin back and look as far as you can to the left, right? Like 10, 10 reps to the left, 10 reps to the right, working on that range of motion through that uh, part of the spinal column. And then also looking back and up, back and up the other way. So all that kind of stuff is really well integrated into the training program here at Langley. I just, I want to share a couple of random riffs. These aren't questions. These are just things I was thinking about <laughs> as you were talking. Um, one is we got all these strength and conditioning coaches who are super hyped on like iron neck devices and things like that. Meanwhile, it's like got, the little crown thing where you twist. Your yeah. Neck. It's like attached to a bungee cord and all that stuff. Meanwhile, we got F1 drivers and fighter pilots training with the lowest tech classic stuff that doesn't require anything. I think there's a lesson in that. And then the second one is the machine you described at the beginning Soldiers will know that as the four-way neck machine that is in almost every army base. Um, very popular with soldiers who are worried about passing body composition testing <laughs> because up until recently we had like a neck to waist ratio thing going on where if you had a bigger neck, you could carry a little more at your waist. We changed our, our test recently. So that's a little bit different now, but for a long time, that was like the favorite machine of people who were trying to get a little more wiggle room on there. Which uh, versus just get on the treadmill and lose weight. <laughs> Big facts. No, dude. Yeah. I'm just gonna get a bigger yeah. neck. Stop eating at the base Burger King. <laughs> oh, don't trigger Drew. Yeah, dude. Oh man. Fast food on military installations. We won't go there. But it's interesting that you just kind of went through that series because I sort of and I and I've talked with General Drelly about this, but like, man, how cool would it be to, you know, work as a as a pilot human performance specialist because you have an excuse to go to Monaco every year and like do quote unquote research because you're watching Formula One. But as I'm sitting here thinking about it, it's a little bit different for you guys because you're you're moving around in the cockpit, like you're locking on and moving your head. And when I'm thinking of a Formula One driver, sure, there's some of that. But by and large, I would imagine it's more of an isometric thing. And you're trying to stabilize when all of this is going on so you can focus on the track. And I hadn't really even thought about that until you started talking because I've seen you know, they obviously do a lot of the same things that you guys do, I would I would think. But I've every video you see of those guys training, it's a lot of isometric and sort of fighting movement, which makes sense when you see them and again, you know, driving those things and sitting still. But I, I would like I said, I would I would love to have an excuse to just go to Monaco one year and say that I'm doing doing work. Have you been have you been in a Formula One car before? I've not been in an F one car, no. <laughs> I would love to be. If you have an opportunity say, for me, I'll sign right up. Yeah, no, we'll we'll keep you posted if we ever get Max for staffing on the podcast. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah, so, we can compare notes. Be like, oh, you think your training's hard? We yeah, put you right? in the back of the F sixteen when they go do some basic fighter maneuvers. <laughs> he gets compensated well enough that I don't think he needs to worry about yeah, how hard the fair. training is. That's fair. <laughs> that's right. I I do want to go a pretty different direction. It's related to what you mentioned about the eight or nine hour flights. Um, I did do a little background research on you. You've, you've shared thoughts on a lot of things. I listened to some conversations. I'm um, on one. You talked about like an 11 and a half hour flight out. It was either to or from Japan. And I'm, yep. I'm thinking through the very different demands of something like that. Like it's, it's easy to picture the like air to air combat or air to ground targeting kind of stuff and the demands of that. But now, like an A-10 is a single seat aircraft, so there's nobody else taking over the controls during that flight. It's no flight you're attendants. There, you're in command of the aircraft the entire time. Like, are there protocols for things like hydration, nutrition, caffeine in something like that? Like, how do you maintain like the cognitive vigilance required 
in an 11 and a half hours, no enemies, just like auto cruising for half a day. Protocols. Not really. Um, <laughs> like there's, there's nothing that says like thou shalt drink a gallon of water the day before you fly in 11 and a half hour sortie from Japan to Alaska. Um, but like there, we're all type A personalities in the fighter and attack worlds. So for the most part, people know what they need to do. Like for me, I had a grocery bag, uh, that had like two Gatorades, a bunch of power bars. And like, if you guys have deployed it all, like we have the jamwiches, they're like pre-wrapped peanut butter and jellies that look like somebody stitched the edge around and cut the crust off. Yeah. Uncrustables. 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 Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no free, ads, no free ads. Yeah, exactly. I call them jam witches because I, I was like trying that. to avoid that problem. I didn't want you guys to get hit for any trademark law or something I don't know about. That's okay. No, Drew uh, loves giving these companies free advertising. I think the sure. Carolina Panthers just talked about how many Uncrustables they go through per game. No, it was the Ravens. I think it was, it was the Ravens. Ravens. Okay. Yeah, the Panthers Ravens can't afford it. God. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was born in Baltimore. I could not oh. be more excited about this AFC Championship game. But I digress. Oh, <laughs> back, back to my 11 and a half hour sortie. So I also had a camelback that I put up in the quarter panel. So we have a glare shield and there's some space where you can stuff things up here. Um, and because you're just we're just navigating from one place to another, I'm not worried about visual lookout out there as much. So I had a camelback up there with the hose hanging down uh, off my right console so I could drink water whenever I wanted. One of the unfortunate parts about flying across the Pacific is that the water's cold. And when the water's cold, we have to wear the anti-exposure suit. So I don't know if you guys have seen these anti-exposure suits, but it basically creates a seal around your neck. Uh, it creates a seal around your wrists. And then it's like a onesie because your feet are encapsulated in like a kind of a meshy material, but that's waterproof. And the idea is if you hit the cold water, the anti-exposure suit will buy you enough time to get into your life raft uh, before you'll be hypothermic. So it keeps you from going hypothermic while you're trying to get into your life raft in cold water. The problem with the anti-exposure suit is like when you're just in a cockpit and it's not 40 degrees, that thing is like choking the life out of you for a lot <laughs> of suit. Yeah. It's, it's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a sweatsuit. Right. Uh, and it makes going to the restroom more difficult. Uh, so one of the things you might be thinking to yourself when you hear that I did an 11 and a half hour story, you're like, how do you relieve yourself when you're trying to stay hydrated and focused and fly your airplane across the Pacific? You're like, well, there's this big crossbody zipper on the anti exposure suit. And then under that, I have my flight suit. So I have another zipper to bring all the way up. Uh, and then I have to like finagle my way to be able to get access to relieve myself. Uh, and then we have the little plastic bags that have a powder in them that will turn to a gel and they have a zip tie at the top. So, you know, I'm like, okay, made it three hours into the mission, <laughs> starting to get a little tired. They, we get go pills from the flight docs. So basically amphetamines <laughs> that I'm like three hours in, I had to plan. I'm going to take my go pill. I'm going to drink some Gatorade to make sure the go pill doesn't dehydrate me to death. Uh, drink some water. And then like three hours in, it's probably time to relieve myself. So I like fan out away from the formation a little ways, set the altitude and heading hold on a course that will take me away from everyone else for a little bit so that as I go hands off of my throttle and stick, I can do all of this finagling to get into access what I need to access to relieve myself. Relieve myself into my horrific plastic bag. Uh, you kind of like shake the thing up a little bit so that it turns from liquid into a gel. And then you can like roll the thing up and use the zip tie to seal it. And then the same grocery bag that I had all my snacks in previously that I've now scattered to other places is the grocery bag is my like piddle pack disposal bag and just stuff it under my suit and know that like when I get to Alaska, I'll probably have like three or four of these piddle packs that are going to be in the grocery bag that I have to throw in a dumpster when I get there. They did not cover <laughs> um, this part in Top Gun. I missed it at least. No, <laughs> yeah. no, they skipped this part. So this brings up an interesting human performance problem. It is way more difficult for female air crew. To I was relieving. Yep. I was thinking about that. So that no kidding. There are devices out there for female air crew. The problem is in normal training environments where you're flying hour and a half, two hours, there's almost no need to use a relief device. You can go to the bathroom right before you step, you step to the airplanes, fly 
you're back like three hours later and you can use the bathroom again. When you have these long haul missions for some of the female air crew that maybe haven't worked on using the devices that they need to use, it can be like very anxiety inducing for them to try to use this thing. Um, and we had issues on my first deployment to Inherent Resolve with uh, some of the female air crew that weren't comfortable with it right out of the gates were actually dehydrating themselves prior to a mission hmm. in the hopes that yep. they wouldn't have to go while they're airborne. But that has um, its own consequences cognitively and physically. Yeah. Mm. And that's what we ran into. We had no idea what was going on until one of the female air crew came back from a mission, very nauseous, did not look good. And that's when we found out that they had been dehydrating themselves to try to avoid using the device so that was something that I was not obviously keen on, uh, but a very important leadership lesson for any other air crew members out there of like, keep an eye on your female air crew members, make sure in the training environment, they have an opportunity to figure out how to use those devices and use them efficiently. Uh, because when you get to combat, it's not the time for people to be dehydrating themselves to avoid going in the jet. Lesson learned, the 11 and a half hour haul, I mean, it's it's what you would expect. It's very boring. We task the lieutenants to have entertainment that they will use on the radio, uh, <laughs> whether it's like little pop quiz questions or pop trivia uh, or like bring some funny stories to tell. And then our inner flight frequency uh, starts off very professional, rapidly breaks down into lieutenants telling jokes for however long they can last. As soon as they run out of jokes, we heckle them and tell them they're terrible lieutenants. And then we fly for like five more hours just listening to an audio book in one ear and the radio in the other. And, uh, don't I imagine tell anybody, but it's pretty common. There's got to be some like enemy submarine just like listening in on the audio. Like, what the <laughs> hell is going on? But as, if they're so, listening to that, they're certainly not getting anything of value out of this. <laughs> but as you were talking about, I mean, because my question initially was, uh, again, like with the with the female, but like now I'm starting to think about some of the gastrointestinal conversations that happen with ultra endurance athletes. And when it comes to nutrition and fueling, I mean, you know, I, I deal with this with guys training for different selection events and thinking about rucking and, you know, that is not 11 and a half hours, but you always like, hey, you know, practice what you're going to do in the field. Don't don't start taking energy gels during the event. If that's not something that you've kind of quote unquote trained for, because if your body is not ready for that, you're going to have, I mean, to put it politely, you're going to have some gastrointestinal issues. Does yeah. that part of the conversation take place when we're looking at an 11 and a half hour flight? And I mean, you mentioned the solution for peeing, but what happens if something else needs to take place? Uh, that conversation does happen. <laughs> we do go up armed with a, I'm blanking on the name of the drug, uh, but it's the one that blocks you up. Man, it's basically a, a anti-diarrheal. It's a blocker. Yeah, it's a blocker. Clearly, the night prior and the morning of a long flight, when you know it's coming, like you're not going to get breakfast burritos, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, you're trying to make sure that you're you're probably not hunting down fiber in the morning taking it easy on the coffee. <laughs> and then if it happens in flight, there are two options. If you have the time, there are pilots that have completely stripped down in the cockpit. Yes. Uh, and then either had a trash bag ready, got on them, <laughs> or another pilot who did not have a trash bag ready realized like my helmet bag is just going to be a sacrifice to the gods today. Because <laughs> um, you can't roll the down the bag. window. <laughs> Yeah, I wish, wish that was an option. Turns out at 250 knots at yeah. 20,000 feet, you just freeze to death. The problem only gets worse in that situation. Yeah, I'm just yeah, going like, to sit out on no, the wing There's no quick. great answer other than like suck it up and find something to poop in. Um, <laughs> that's it, right? Uh, and then there's a handful of folks out there who like – Time was of the essence. Like there was no time to deal with that problem. There were combat problems to deal with. And like, they just pooped in their pants that, you know, like we've all mission been there. over mission over self, like, Hey man, <laughs> sacrifice the flight suit, sacrifice the <laughs> underwear. Like there are some people that need to eat bullets or eat bombs and to hell with it. I'm going in my pants. 
Is the Air yeah. Force also struggling with recruiting? Because I'm starting to envision a new advertising campaign. I could really. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely didn't know this uh, was the direction we were going to go in, but I'm glad we did. This is like, this is good content. This was not in the notes pre-episode, I promise. <laughs> I, I don't know about Air Force recruiting, to be honest. I haven't looked at numbers or anything. Um, my whole business right now is senior leader management. So I'm, I'm focused on trying to retain much, much older folk. That's fair. I, I would guess if the Army's having problems, your Air Force is probably fighting to keep recruiting just as hard because mm -hmm. my guess would be part of it is like it's like everyone has a job right like for a long time unemployment used to hang out around that six to nine percent now unemployment's way way down so for a large portion of the younger enlisted population like it was it was a job mm -hmm. and now that jobs are all over the place i think it's it's difficult to get people to come serve when they can go get another job mm -hmm. just a wild guess and that is you know ridge flick speaking not any representative of dod or anything like that don't worry we got but a disclaimer for all the episodes <laughs> that's perfect yeah paste so, a big uh, old disclaimer over the whole thing for me please oh yeah. for sure we will uh we will i think try to bring this back a little bit towards traditional human performance topics um i was <laughs> I was thinking about some of the cognitive performance stuff you've mentioned before, and I saw something you wrote about a few instances in combat, like recognizing a risk of killing friendlies and aborting a mission, and then the opposite of that, identifying enemy targets that no one else could because of the position you were in. Could you talk through like some of those scenarios and what the like the cognitive component going into that is, and like how much time you have to make the decision and what goes into it? Yeah, definitely. I'll start with. The one where somebody recognized a potential fratricide event that was about to happen and was able to an abort an attack. Um, so we had a, a fairly young flight lead during my first deployment and both the ground controller and the uh, ISR aircraft that were involved were like convinced they've got a valid target. Um, and they passed the targeting information to this young flight lead and they want him to drop a weapon that the intelligence bird is going to guide in using a laser. Uh, he plots the coordinates for where they're asking for him to drop the weapon to. And our ground liaison officer at the squadron would update most recent lines for where the frontline trace of friendly forces was. And we would get an update like every four hours, he would update the files so that the next flight that went out had the most fresh information they could have. So the flight lead, you know, asks, hey, is this time sensitive? No, they've been in the same position for the last, you know, 20 minutes while we were waiting for you to get on station. He's like, okay, uh, which was an important note because when something's not time sensitive, we have time to do the critical thinking, right? You don't have to just go gut reflex instinct. So he does a good plot, sees that the target coordinates are actually on the friendly side of the line that we have on our map. So he calls back. He says, hey, I'm plotting these target coordinates are in the friendly area. He's like, are you, is it confirmed with the ground commander that this is, in fact, enemy? And he's like, yes, it's confirmed. I've confirmed it five times already. Give me the weapon. So he's like, hey, I would feel a lot better if you can get me an altitude below the weather so I can take a look at this enemy position and guide the weapon in myself rather than just blindly trust that, Everybody's got this doped. So begrudgingly, the ground controller gets him a lower altitude. He comes, breaks out of the weather. And when he gets his targeting pod on the area, he realizes the pattern of life does not match what we would normally see out of ISIS, right? So the people hanging out on rooftops, they're kind of relaxed, smoking cigarettes, things that you just wouldn't see ISIS do at that time in that place. So he calls that out and the JTAC's like, Dude, don't care. I've already confirmed with the ground commander. This is a valid target. You need to drop your weapons, guy. Or he's like, I'll tell you what. Ask the ground commander to have all of his people get off of all rooftops in the area. Which I had never even considered the, that thought process until I heard it in his tape afterwards. So he's like, fine. Ask ground commander. You know, two minutes go by. And in the target pod, you see everybody stamping out their cigarettes off the roof and into the building. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a 
first lieutenant, he might have just pinned on captain at the time, who's on his first combat deployment. And just based on his training, his mm -hmm. knowledge of the enemy, his knowledge of how the friendly forces in that area operated, he was able to like assert his will in that situation and prevent probably nine friendlies from eating a 500 pound bomb. And that's something that I think a lot of other communities, because they have so many other missions they train to, it would have been really difficult for them to catch that there was an error made by like three different people. Like the ground commander had made an error in tracking his own troops. The ground controller had made an error in positively identifying it as a valid target. And the Intel aircraft had made an error in also not recognizing enemy TTP versus friendly technique and procedure. And it took this like young A-10 captain to recognize that. And it's because of the training, right? Like going into that deployment, he was a captain with probably 350 hours in the airplane. Out of that 350 hours, he had probably done 200, 225 hours of close air support training. So he'd seen a lot. He had a big bag of experience to rely on to understand what he needs to push back on and when he needs to go fangs out and employ weapons. On the corollary that you're getting to of like quick thinking and quick decisions, um, there was one instance where one of our flight leads was able to see three vehicles moving at a very high speed through open desert towards a partner force position. So no actual U.S. forces there, just a partner force. Um, and he's, he's calling this out to a U.S. ground controller explaining what he sees. He's like, I think this is a vehicle-borne IED attack. And the ground controller is like, dude, I have no situational awareness in that area. I have no way of knowing what's going on. Um, so before anything even happens, he starts posturing his wingman to engage the vehicles. Just put them in the right position, right? Like, get ready. I think we're going to end up having to shoot these guys. And then fast forward about 30 seconds, one of the vehicles explodes. So now there's two vehicles still moving high speed. One explodes. He calls it out to the ground controller. He's like, hey, one of these vehicles just detonated. We need to roll in on this now. I need clearance. And the ground controller comes back. He's like, dude, I don't have any situational awareness. I can't give you clearance. If you think you need to roll in in self-defense, like that's on you. Um, and about 10 seconds later, one of the two vehicles turned around and hightailed it out of there, knowing that like whatever they were trying to do was not going to work out the way they thought. The other vehicle kept going. Uh, so he rolls in and puts like 200 rounds into this vehicle about 100 meters away from where the friendly forces were holed up in a defensive fighting position. The vehicle like basically starts drifting to a stop uh, and no kidding, like rolls up to the berm in front of the friendly forces, stops. He's like, oh man, he's like, I either did something really great or I'm gonna lose my wings over this. Cause like, didn't have clearance, didn't have the standard nine line targeting information that was required in that theater at the time. Um, just like did what he felt was right. And then the friendly forces end up like slowly creeping out to this vehicle. And as soon as they open the door, you see them all run. The driver had been killed and the engine had been knocked out by one of the 30 mil rounds. All the tires were blown. Um, but somehow the bullets didn't hit any of the C4 that was in the back seat. So when they opened the door, they went running because they saw that it was a massive vehicle borne IED. Uh, and then they were able to, you know, pull the body out and basically put a charge in there, get a safe distance away and blow it in place. But that was one where, uh, kind of the opposite, right. Of like, I don't have time. I have to go off my gut mm -hmm. and make it happen. Um, and that plays into some of the cognitive training. So one of the unique things I've seen here at Langley is they have uh, cognitive training. If you've ever seen the light boards, right? You stand in front of it, different lights pop up and you see how quick you can pop lights out. They have a similar thing called go, no go. And it pops up like U S aircraft or adversary aircraft. And at the start, it tells you like, here's the U S aircraft. Here's the adversary aircraft. You need to tap. So now not only are you trying to go as quick as you can, but you're trying to not tap on U.S. aircraft 
and mm -hmm. tap on adversary aircraft. Um, so it adds a little bit of that like hesitation in to make a decision first and then finish the reaction. Uh, and I thought that was a really clever thing for fighter pilots of like, you've got the gut instinct, use the gut instinct, but also like you need to get positive identification. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's fairly unique in that we have to make these decisions in a second, two seconds. Uh, and sometimes you might be shifting targets on final, right? So I've had one where initially I'm expecting I'm going to be hitting one target. As I roll out, I realize that that target's now fleeing and there's another target that I need to hit that's still engaging friendly forces. Um, so those decisions happen quick and you still have to be able to process information, even though you may be committed to one course of action. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's kind of the cognitive piece uh, that you probably I hinted at, I think, in a LinkedIn post on that one. Um, it kind of expands the story out, gives you a little more of the background on it. I appreciate it. And based on how much there is here on the human performance side to discuss, I don't think we're going to have time for a conversation about like the legacy of the A-10 airframe and how ground forces feel about it and like the, the fight to keep it in the force and stuff like that. But I do want to help kind of with a, a continuing transition towards more traditional human performance topics. And I'm going to, I found myself doing this a lot on episodes recently. I'm going to quote you <laughs> to you. It's kind of a theme for Alex. Uh, lately. Yeah, it sure is. I do my background <laughs> research. What can I say? But uh, I, you do. That's impressive. He's an so Intel guy. He's a former Intel. I, I was an Intel guy. That's part of the deal. Ah, uh, um, I get it. Yeah. So you're, the line is, and this is coming from you. In my experience, the platform accounts for about 25% of an airframe's cast capability. Close the air training, support. Yeah, close air support for that audience. The training, experience, and dedication of the air crew to the close air support mission account for 75% of the capability. Can you describe for us what components of executing that mission are human versus what components of executing that mission are machine? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the human component is in how you process the information. So a lot of what we do when we're training young A-10 flight leads that are, or wingmen that are trying to become flight leads is we bake in all the basic foundations of how to do close air support. So they know the 12 step process for close air support. They know every line of what's in a nine line. They know how to do CASAVAX. They have all the knowledge. Um, and then beyond the base level knowledge, we build in situational problems that we expect them to see in combat. Uh, and when you like the platform's got 50 years of history behind it now, almost. So there's a lot of corporate knowledge of close air support and combat search and rescue in the A-10 community. Right. Like we had, I think sweetness might've just retired, but sweetness had like 7,000 hours in the A-10 and flew in desert storm. And he was still flying a couple of years ago. Last I saw it's hard to, replace corporate knowledge like that. But the part that I would say is why I say it's like 75% on the person is that if you put in the time and you build the scenarios and you're practicing the same way that you're going to fight and you make things a little ambiguous in some of your training and you force people to make decisions when there aren't real bombs hitting and there aren't real friendly forces that could die you start instilling in them a sense of confidence that they'll be able to handle situations they haven't seen before. Um, and that is heavily what close air support is. You know, like I can't think of a whole lot of employments that I had with different weapons where I'm like, Oh, this is exactly the same as what I did yesterday. Right. And everything is just a little different. Uh, it could be the sun angle creating a different glare off a heads up display that requires me to change my attack axis. It could be, I have terrible visibility because of a sandstorm, and now I'm having to completely change the way that I hold. I need to hold really close to the target, and my poor wingman is just glued on my wing waiting for me to give directions. Um, there's a lot of different things that can happen that unless you have that hundreds of hours of dealing with different problems in training, when it happens in combat, you won't know what to do. The secondary piece of that is when you have the hundreds of hours and you show up and you check in with confidence and you provide your fighter check in with confidence and you get the situation update and you're asking smart questions about, Hey, where's this friendly unit? 
Okay. Where are all the aircraft in the airspace right now? Okay. It starts to show the rest of the people on that frequency that you know what you're doing and you can be the leader in that environment. Um, so without ever saying a word, generally speaking, when there's a couple different fighters or a bomber, uh, you know, an ISR bird and a two ship of A-10s in the same close air support airspace, that when the A-10s check in, the leadership role is still with the ground controller, but that airborne leadership role tends to reside within the A-10 formation purely based off experience and training. Um, it has nothing to do with the airplane itself. It has more to do with the training of the people inside of it. The place where the airframe matters is mostly in the software development. So it's real nice having a 30 millimeter cannon with a lot of bullets. I will say that. <laughs> uh, it is extremely flexible. It is very quick to get rounds down on target. And if I, like, if I see something that matters, I don't need to like use a targeting pod to generate a coordinate to do all this stuff. Like I can just roll in and shoot it. That is nice. Um, and it's fairly unique uh, to the A-10. So that's like one airframe capability that when the A-10 goes away, we're going to lose that. You're not, you're not going to have a bunch of fighters rolling around trying to strafe things uh, and do multiple reattacks really quickly. Um, the other piece that I got from talking to one of my uh, F-16 buddies is the armor. Um, so the armor is a unique thing in the A-10, and that allows us to fly closer to the ground, closer to friendly and enemy forces uh, with a certain sense of security that, like, I may get shot, like, I may lose an engine, I may have half a wing blow off, but, like, I'm probably not going to die. Um, like, I will probably either be able to eject or I'll be able to limp this airplane back to friendly territory before ejecting or limp it all the way home. Um, I don't know if you've seen, like, Casey Campbell's story, uh, hit by a missile. Um, lost an engine and was able to fly without any hydraulic pressure using the manual reversion mode where you're basically flying like stick and pulley off of the trim tabs. Mm -hmm. And she flew it all the way back and landed it. And that was back during OIF, I think. Yeah, basically Desert Storm 2.0 in the early 2000s. But that's that gives us the confidence to fly low and close, right? And when you're flying low and close your eyeballs become a lot more effective at being able to see where the friendly forces are and see where there might be threats to those friendly forces um, versus we call the targeting pot a soda straw because it's got a really tiny field of view. I can see things pretty well, but I have to know where to look first. Um, and so part of what we've done with the A-10 from a software standpoint is like, if I see something over the rail with a helmet mounted sight, I can get my targeting pod to that spot right away. I hold one button down for a second. My targeting pod goes, and it looks exactly where my eyeball was looking. Hmm. The follow on piece of that is our moving map. We can actually load imagery all the way down to like one meter imagery. So I can pull imagery for the area I know I'm going to operate and I can have one meter imagery, five meter imagery. I can have a one to 50 K map. So I have a little bit better understanding of terrain features and things I might have to use uh, to fly into a contested area or something like that. Um, most of the other fighters, they don't quite go to that level of fidelity because they're going to cover big areas to do air to air stuff, or they're taking out long range surface air missiles. So they need a bigger field of view on their scope. Um, and they're usually not loaded up with quite the same level of fidelity in terms of like, where's the frontline trace of friendlies? Where are all the friendly artillery positions? Where is, uh, the expected enemy hotspots, right? I can put a lot of that stuff into my moving map and have a zoom in. I can zoom all the way into like 150 meter scope uh, and see what's in that area in my system at 150 meter scope. So some unique things we've done on that front. Um, some unique things we've done for uh, using multiple weapons in one pass. So that came about during Inherent Resolve where uh, ISIS was everywhere. We needed to be able to drop more bombs in one pass. So uh, a unique factor of the A-10, it's completely government owned. So we have uh, government people that write the software. So when we say, hey, we need this change and we need it fast, I don't have to go try to contract it out to Lockheed or contract it to Boeing. I go to the A-10 program office and we go, this is what we need. And when can we get it? And like, we'll put it in the next flight program it releases in six months like great so the software piece has been a pretty big one in recent years 
think that's largely because of that C model upgrade that we got back in like 2008, where now we have the color displays. Uh, shortly after that, we got the helmet mounted sight. Um, the laser guided rockets have been really impressive. So that was a new weapon for us around the 2016 timeframe. Um, and that's, that's unique to the A-10 and the F-16. So there's nobody else toting rocket pods around on fighter aircraft. Um, but it's a, it's a really impressive weapon, uh, low collateral damage, hyper accurate. So those are some of the unique aircraft capabilities. Do you think, and I'm thinking about this kind of from the human element and sort of the, like, you know, we don't need to go through the entire history of aviation, but like as the capabilities of fighter aircraft have increased, I mean, and, and you could take that to its logical extreme of like potentially unmanned aircraft, but as, as those capabilities have increased, what has changed or what do you foresee change changing when it comes to some of the things we talked about earlier, just like basic training of a, of a pilot from a physical standpoint? I mean, does that, does that change as the job becomes less human, more technology, or is it just a slightly different conversation? Well, it's really hard to tell. So I think as weapons get longer ranges, as aircraft have gotten more expensive and the willingness to lose one has decreased, I think the physical training will start taking a backseat to cognitive training because I don't think you'll see as many of those old school engagements where two aircraft are tying up and you're pulling a lot of G's to try and get to the other person's six o'clock. I think you're going to see a lot more processing information off of what you've observed and how you've oriented to that information, making the right decision and taking the right action, right? The John Boyd OODA loop, mm -hmm. but instead of applying it to basic fighter maneuvers, applying it to beyond visual range weapons employment. Um, I think that's where you'll see it start to shift to. Uh, at the end of the day, as long as there are fighter aircraft that can pull nine G's and there are fighter pilots that are expecting they might need to tie up and get within visual range, you're still going to have that physical component. If we go like fully unmanned and I really am just sitting in a connex somewhere like controlling a fighter from there, I'm like, I don't need to keep strengthening my neck anymore. I probably don't care as much about it. Well, you'll need a bigger neck to pass the tape, which we mentioned earlier. So we've come <laughs> full circle here. As you go unmanned and gain weight, you're going to need a bigger neck. So it, it all, you know, it remains relevant, which leads me to my next question. Which Watch is, out for sleep apnea in that situation, <laughs> though. <laughs> one of the things, one of the things that General Drowley mentioned when we were kind of talking previous to any of this was some of the feedback that you give to the human performance teams. And I'm, I'm, the, the question I just asked was kind of a lead into that because I want to know from a, from a pilot who's done a lot of things, as you see folks coming into this space to allegedly train you, what conversations are you having with them in terms of what an appropriate performance program would look like? Uh, so I think one of the biggest things I usually give feedback on is get folks to be honest about what injuries they've had in the past because that is most likely the first thing that will break uh, when they least want it to break. So if somebody's had a neck issue in the past, if they've had a back issue in the past, if they've had whatever, sciatica, something, heck, even if they've had like shoulder problems, even those can flare up when you're trying to rotate around, move your arms under G. Because once you know where someone's weak points are, it becomes easier to build a strength program and a conditioning program that is designed to bolster the muscle groupings around that area so that they're less likely to break in a place they've broken before. I think that's one of the critical pieces. One of the other ones, uh, when I first got to Langley, we actually, uh, based on some like PTSD type things I had seen in a previous squadron, I brought up the fact that like not a lot of the fighter pilots in the air to air world have experience dealing with, employing weapons against manned aircraft. Like there haven't been a lot of air to air shoot downs, right? Like I'm sure crushing the balloon felt good. I was going to say probably the balloon. not losing any sleep, right? You're, like, you're probably not losing <laughs> sleep thinking about, man, somebody worked hard to build that balloon. I feel terrible that I just d took their work and put it right in the Atlantic. <laughs> Nobody's losing sleep over that. But I, I talked to the guys here. I was like, Hey, if we really are trying to get ready for a future fight where these guys might be going out and killing people in airplanes, 
they need to start thinking about it now. They need to start thinking about how they are going to cope. They need to think about whether it's going to be a journal or if it's going to be some kind of mindfulness training that they do on their own time. And it should be discussed. It should be something that we talk. So that's been one of the things I've brought to Langley with me. Probably the only other one is the cognitive training. So I give mm-hmm. feedback on the cognitive training here uh, for the go, no go. There was no a 10 on the friendly side. I was like, what is this <laughs> instant feedback, instant feedback. Where's These guys going to shoot me down. They're not even going to know what I look like out there. <laughs> did they put an eight? Did they put an a 10 on there? They did. Nice. They well did done. put an a 10 on there. So now <laughs> I'm feeling pretty safe. Uh, I feel pretty safe. Um, but part of the feedback too was even just in my own training plan, right? I'm like, Hey, I actually am, really enjoying getting a couple sets in, getting a cognitive rep, getting a set in, getting a cognitive rep. I was like, I'd like to see that in a couple extra exercises. And it's like the next day I've got a new plan loaded. It's got a couple more cognitive reps mixed into a couple different exercises. Um, So I think a lot of it needs to come down to each individual pilot providing feedback tailored to where they think they need to work on things. But those are probably the three big ones I would say. Yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing team here at Langley. So um, very different than any other base I've been to. They've got, it's like a division one college gym here at Langley. And they've got a great staff, multiple strength coaches, cognitive coach, two physical, uh, two massage therapists, a physical therapist, just a phenomenal staff taking care of the airmen out here. So hard to give them a whole lot of critical feedback. So speaking of division one, collegiate athletic programs and things like that. We're going to finally get to a topic that I thought we were going to open this episode with. I did not really predict the whole conversation about how do you go to the bathroom in the cockpit and stuff. Hey, that was um, gold. It was fantastic content. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> but we thought curtain. we were going to, we thought we were going to open this conversation <laughs> with addressing the fact that you played collegiate lacrosse at the air force Academy. And as I understand it, you're now an avid bodybuilder. And I, we were curious <laughs> about how those things influence your perspective on human performance and We're kind of getting to it as we close the conversation here, but better late than never. Yeah. Um, So obviously division one lacrosse is extremely difficult on your body. Um, So I learned a lot in college about getting hurt, coming back from injuries, how to strengthen the muscle groupings around an injury um, and the long-term positive effects that had on my career. Again, very lucky at the Air Force Academy. There was a phenomenal st- like staff. We had a doc who was also a physical therapist who we could see every day to get rehab done, knock out 15, 20 minutes of rehab before practice, get out of practice, hit the ice bath, uh, get everything a little bit tightened up, but get some of the brown fat going, and then boom, right back into electro stem. Um, just, I had a really bad back injury. Uh, in the start of my sophomore season. So I was in there like every day for an entire year trying to build up the muscles around my lower back, glutes, hip flexors, uh, doing everything I could to take pressure off of my lower spine. Um, And uh, Ernie, God bless his heart, he was uh, (laughs) just moving my legs around in all different directions for like 15 minutes every day trying to get rid of the little bit of sciatica that had come from that injury. But that was, uh, from a human performance standpoint, a great education for me of seeing what things I need to do, seeing where I need to stay strong. Cause I know I've got like, I've separated this shoulder twice. So I know I've got to keep this shoulder mobile. I've got to keep the strength of all the different sides of the shoulder and the chest active. I got to keep the neck flexible or else that can also start to spring down into my shoulder. Um, back problems, knee problems, all that stuff. I, I kind of already had training regimens built around keeping myself from breaking, uh, when I got to pilot training. Um, and man, a lot of great leadership lessons out of, uh, grinding it out at the Academy while trying to play division one sports. So a lot of frustrated, uh, lacrosse players and getting to be a team captain in the senior year. Like it was a serious challenge of trying to find ways to lead guys through the Colorado winter where we're down Mm. on the field, freezing our butts off every day, going straight back up to get chow and then right into homework until you can't see straight and you pass out. But it was a great experience. How that's played into the bodybuilding. I mean, I am just a competitive SOB man. Like um, if I can't get my competitive uh, itch scratched, I will try to find a way to scratch it myself. Um, So when I got assigned up onto the staff, 
I initially joked around with the training guys here. I was like, all right, I'm here for three years. I was like, when I leave, I want to be an NFL free safety. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, Jeff is the lead trainer here at the human performance area. He's like, that's hilarious. Uh, you're never going to be fast enough. And I was like, fair enough. And I was like, let me figure out something else. So <laughs> um, I thought about it for a little bit and I realized like, this is probably the one opportunity where I can do some training that's not solely focused on becoming a better fighter pilot. Uh, and I can do something competitive that'll at least keep me in good shape. Um, and then as I get close to the end of the assignment, close to getting back into the jet, I can refocus on more pilot fitness things, you know, because like being at 4.6% body fat uh, is not necessarily ideal for handling a bunch of sweating and G's for two hours. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's been an interesting journey for sure. Um, I've learned a ton in the bodybuilding process about controlling macronutrients uh, for different goals. So like when I want to pack on some uh, muscle, I know how to switch my macros up now. I have a diet plan that I can just go like, I'm all right, I'm done cutting. I want to build some muscle back up switch the diet plan on my uh, app and then bam, I'm right back into feeling good and jolly uh, and packing on some pounds. <laughs> and then when I know that I'm getting a little soft around the midsection, uh, switch the diet plan back, add a little bit of cardio in, get the higher rep sets, lower weights uh, and get a cut in. Um, but it, it's really helped keep things fresh, right? Cause like three year staff tour, it'd be really easy to be like, whatever, I'll just maintain, go to the gym three days a week. Uh, enjoy my life. Uh, but the competitive spirit has me uh, still grinding in that gym for about 90 minutes a morning. So I don't think this is going to make it into the intro. So I do want to like shamelessly plug his athletic performance before we close out this conversation. <laughs> he, he like slightly humbly talked about trying to like balance being a cadet in academics and like play D one sports and stuff. But I, I'm pulling up the air force men's lacrosse thing here. I'm just going to pull a couple Intel things guy, out of it. Dude. Intel guy. Uh, Team's offensive MVP led the Falcons in points and assists. Um, started thirteen to fourteen games on the season. Um, scored in almost all of the games. Just, I think he was doing pretty well balancing the the cadet stuff and the athletics stuff. Um, had some like tied for second in the league and sixteenth in the nation for assists. Yeah, he was doing all right. Team player. It was uh, so as I got older at the academy, I got smarter, and I realized I'm not good at scoring goals but I know who is. So I figured out pretty quick how to feed the rock to the right guys on the team at the right time to let them bury it. You know? Hey, there's some so, leadership lessons in there. I like see, that. Look at that. Perfect. Know your strengths, know your weaknesses. <laughs> Don't try to focus on your weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you, we, we kind of let off with our, our stereotypical pilot question. And I want to, I want to close with the same. Um, and, I think you're actually the first pilot we've had on since we had General Drowley, if I'm not mistaken. No kidding. And I, I'm curious. So you're not allowed to say A10, but I want to know your top three. And you can go whatever time period you want, but top three aircraft. All time. All time. Flown wow. or not, doesn't matter. You've got the entirety of human aviation at your disposal right now, except for the A10. Okay. I think you have to put uh, the P51 up there so one. glad you said that that is such a sexy plane sorry it is uh and i mean revolutionary performance absolutely smoked all the other aircraft that it was fighting against and just a lot of history around the p-51 and phenomenal air combat stories around the p-51 so i think that's number one number two is a tough one man um because i think if i if i'm looking back at the history books and if i were to look 30 years into the future and people are like, what were the greatest airplanes of all time? I think the Eagle is going to be up there, right? Like 144 and O or something like that, I think are the stats. It's like 144 victories and like never been shot down. Is that the F-15? Like, okay. F-15C. Yep. C, okay. Yep. Yep. So I think you go with the Eagle as number two, purely based on like, was it over budget? Yeah, it was, but man, did it deliver when it mattered? Like, and it's delivered for a number of countries, right? Like Israel is using the F-15 and smoking people in their wars too. So <laughs> I think the F-15 has got to be number two. Um, and this is only, by the way, it's only because you told me I can't say the A-10. Uh, you, you, I also want to point out, you can use other countries because you mentioned P-51, but danced across Spitfire. I'll leave, you know, it's fine. That's fair. 
that's fair. Uh, there's there's a measure Schmidt in there too that would be um, an interesting candidate. Uh, if I go number three, um, man, I think you got to go with the Viper. Um, I, I think you have to like most widely produced and heavily utilized airframe in, I don't know, the last 40 years, right? John Boyd's baby, one of the great thinkers of Air Force history, mm -hmm. guy that in, invented the OODA loop, invented the energy and maneuverability diagram. Uh, and he realized that if I can make something that's lightweight, super maneuverable, uh, and I can make a lot of them, then I can create a problem that nobody can solve. Right. Like if I can put 1500 airplanes up in the sky with the capabilities of the F-16 at that time, there was nobody that was going to be able to counter a force of that size with that capability. And then what they've done in the block upgrades has been brilliant. Right. You get to like the block 70 F-16 where they've got the conformal fuel tanks on the shoulders. It looks like a linebacker now. Um, they've added the uh, harm targeting system in there and all the capabilities that come with that. Now they're starting to put the active electronically scanned array radars on them. Um, it's just a phenomenal airframe. That's It's lasted the test of time and it continues to perform in a bunch of different arenas for different countries. Uh, I mean, we still have block thirties flying today while other countries are blind, like buying the block 70. So I think Viper's probably got to be number three and it's, it's provided a lot of weapons for ground forces in combat over the last 30 years. So Great airplane. I think those would be probably the top three. Um, if I were to just say like, like what airplane is the coolest? I mean, it's got to be the Raptor, right? Like if I can't say the A-10, I have to say the Raptor. Like if you, <laughs> ever, see the cool. F if, if you ever seen the F-22 demo? Yeah. Oh my gosh. The it's maneuverability, cool. the power, the way it shakes the base. I mean, that is a cool airplane. Um, so I think probably the coolest airplane out there, I would say, is the Raptor. Uh, but if I, got, I have to pick a top three all the time, you got them. I got a fast add-on question to that one, and that is, of the airplanes that are in our arsenal at the moment, which do you think could best perform the close air support mission if it was not the A-10? Oh, man. That's so difficult. Um, I, got a, I got a fast add-on real quick. <laughs> he has talked about this topic before. Fair. This is not out of the blue completely. <laughs> it's not completely out of the blue. First caveat, it will totally depend on their training documents mm -hmm. of like what they're going to train to. If I were to take the A-10 training documents and like impart them onto another platform and tell them like, you must go do this now. Um, I mean, I would love for the F-35 to take that on. That would be great. Like it's got such incredible sensor capabilities. Uh, if it doesn't need the stealth, like let's figure out how, how much of a beast mode we can actually build. How many pylons could we put on it? Um, if I have the pylons on it, can I put a rocket pod on and use the laser guided rockets? That would be a big player. Um, but just from a, being able to sense the environment, pick up different things. I think that would be awesome. Uh, a little hesitant about single engine and thin skin airframe trying to do close air support. Uh, particularly for when the fight gets in tight, you know, and you've got enemy inside of a hundred meters and a bomb is not going to do the trick because you're going to hurt your own guys. Uh, like that gun is not good. Um, so I think the realistic choice that will probably end up being the one to take on a lot of the cast missions for the A-10 will be the Viper. Um, and a lot of the guard bases actually have pretty robust close air support training for their F-16 squadrons. Um, so like I was in, uh, Afghanistan at the same time as the Wisconsin guard when they had F-16s, um, and they were good. They were, they trained hard to it. They got ready for the deployment. And when they showed up, they were on point. Um, they had a lot of neat techniques for applying multiple bombs to one problem in one pass. Um, they were getting after it with laser guided rockets. They were using their guns and they didn't seem to have a lot of fear about getting down in the dirt and going after it. Uh, it seemed like they were more than willing to do it. So I think that's the direction it'll probably go is uh, some of the F-16 squadrons taking on that role as the F-35 takes some of the seed role from them. Um, sorry, suppression of enemy air defense role. <laughs> I was just going to go. I'm with, enough of a nerd that I knew that one. Yeah, 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 yeah for the audience. For, for sure, for sure, yeah. for sure. For your audience, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, well, 
Thank you for coming on. This is, I love talking to, we can nerd out about airplanes all day long. This was fun. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. You guys can reach out anytime if you got follow up questions. Uh, and it was a blast. Hey, Alex, let's cover our ass real quick. Oh, great idea, Drew. All right, guys. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Before you go, please rate and review the pod on the listening platform of your choice. You can also visit us on our website at www.mopsinmos.com. That's mops, the letter in, mos.com. You can check out the library of podcast episodes, our latest blog entries, any helpful resources, and also sign up for our newsletter. Drew nailed it. Just to underline a couple of things, the podcast entries have in-depth show notes on the website. So if you missed anything or you want to read any of the research we talk about, it is all there. You can, at the bottom of the website, sign up with your email and receive future updates from us. The blog posts go a little bit more in depth and kind of written form on a couple of topics we get questions about all the time. But most importantly, I just want to ask all you guys, our best way the word gets out is absolutely word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell the people you work with, anybody you think would find it useful. Thanks for spreading the word. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot us an email at either Drew or Alex at mopsandmos.com. Or there's a contact form on the website. Thank you.